Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Ros Childs. On the second anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring COVID a global pandemic, infectious disease experts warn the number of cases will soar as a new viral strain spreads across Australia. The Omicron BA2 subvariant is highly transmissible. The government will spend more than $2 billion to boost for the looming winter Omicron wave, set to coincide with the country's first serious flu season in three years. It's not over um, and there will inevitably be uh, new variants and there will inevitably be a level of virus within the community going forward. Coming up, we'll hear from a GP about what to expect in the cold months ahead. But first, let's bring in Casey Briggs to talk us through the figures. So, Casey, is Australia on the cusp of a new coronavirus wave? Well, it certainly seems so, Roz, whether we want to call it a new wave or perhaps we could call it the Omicron wave part two. Let's just focus on uh, case numbers for the moment, starting in New South Wales, where um, infection numbers are now up to about an average of 12,000 a day. They were about 8,500 a week ago, 7,500 a week before that. So they're going up and they're going up uh, at a faster and faster pace. Why are they going up? Well, undoubtedly one factor has to be that there is less control on this virus in the community as public health rules have eased. But possibly an even bigger part of that is the appearance of BA2, an Omicron subvariant uh, that we're now seeing is more transmissible uh, and, you know, is, is, looks like it's driving the increased uh, spread of infections across New South Wales. Here's what the New South Wales Health Minister had to say this week. The preliminary information indicates that we could be looking in through only another month or six weeks, we could be looking at cases more than double uh, than what we're currently getting. So a doubling of case numbers, that means you're looking at infection numbers on a daily basis in the 20 and 30 thousand and you know even if that doesn't see more serious illness and it might not because uh, remember we are a lot more boosted than we were uh, back in January and a lot more people have been infected with Omicron and other variants now so there's no guarantee that these uh, hospitalizations and the death numbers will climb back to the heights that we saw uh, back in the early days of this year but even if they don't there's a lot of disruption that comes with case numbers that high, uh, both people who are infected and need to isolate, but people who find themselves uh, close contacts, household contacts of cases as well, being sent back into isolation. We saw how disruptive that was in January. So that's New South Wales, but it's not just in New South Wales. The similar pattern of increasing cases occurring in Tasmania, also in South Australia. We're not yet seeing the same trend though in Victoria or Queensland, but given the state borders are open, uh, you would have to think that it is a matter of, uh, that, that BA2 is coming uh, for those states, that uh, an increase in infections is also on the way there, whether it comes sooner or comes later. And the other interesting thing at the moment is uh, who is getting infected at the moment. Let's just jump back to New South Wales, which publishes pretty detailed age breakdowns of its cases. Back uh, in, the, in the initial Omicron wave, let's call it, people between 20 and 40 sort of young adults were making up the bulk of new cases at some points, you know, over the Christmas period, more than half of all cases across the state. But this will come as no surprise to people with school age kids. Uh, people aged 0 to 19 were currently making up about 40, 42% of all of New South Wales cases. That's why we're seeing a lot of clusters happening in schools, a lot of uh, kids being kept home and a lot of, uh, you know, working parents uh, disrupted as well. So that is a little bit of a different dynamic uh, of what we're seeing. Still th almost 30% of people between 20 and 39 uh, infected on a daily basis. About a fifth of all cases are people in their middle ages and people over 60 are still making up a relatively small number of uh, infections. So that is a good thing given uh, how much more serious this illness can be. But, you know, Ros, it does seem, certainly seem like we're heading into another wave probably a bit sooner than people would have liked. Uh, the last one is barely uh, a distant memory. It feels like it's, uh, it feels like we're still coming out of it. Uh, and so this is something we need to brace for in the weeks and months ahead. 
Let's return now to those comments from the New South Wales Health Minister. Professor Catherine Bennett is the Chair in Epidemiology at Deakin University and she joins us now. Hi there, Catherine. Thanks so much for your time. So Brad Hazard there highlighted uh, increasing case numbers of the BA2 subvariant in the state, saying it could push a doubling of case numbers in six weeks. So what do we know about this subvariant? How concerning is it? Well, we know from watching it overseas, it has been circulating for a while, particularly in countries like Denmark, who actually saw this contribute to their main Omicron peak in a much more dramatic way. You know, it built up from a quarter of cases to two thirds quite quickly over the course of that wave. But that helps us learn about it. And what we know so far is they estimate this particular subvariant might be a third more likely to transmit than the current one bearing in mind that that's multiple times more likely to transmit than Delta. So we've already seen the step change. This just pushes it that little bit further. So we do expect it to be just that bit harder to contain infection rates in the community. So they, they can then see a push up in case numbers. In Denmark, though, given that that contribute, contributed in a much more significant way to their main wave, they saw the rest of the world, same story about that not translating to hospital rates, particularly ICU rates, in any way near the numbers that we had seen previously. So it doesn't look to be more severe than the Omicron that we know in Australia, the BA1 variant. So that's reassuring. But we don't want case numbers to go up even a little bit because that's actually still might have more people in hospital. But finally, the difference between now and when we had the Omicron peak in most of our states, you know, it was earlier on where we actually hadn't quite got as uh, far as we wanted to with our booster uh, rollout. So now that we have more people with the booster, particularly those people more vulnerable, that will also help us stop seeing too many more cases in hospitals. So New South Wales, Queensland, case numbers pushing up. We know that the variant is here and we know that this BA2 might contribute to that spread. But we also know that we've had terrible rain. We've had a lot of other things that have taken people's minds off COVID, but also put people indoors more often. And that can also help contribute to spread. Mm. And the federal health minister has announced uh, more money to prepare for the winter to come. Catherine, what can we expect over the next colder months? Lockdowns certainly seem to be a thing of the past here in Australia anyway. And with life essentially back to normal, are we just getting too comfortable now around COVID? Well, lockdowns just don't work in the same way, but masks do. They still help. And whether we need rules in place will depend on how many people just continue to use them when they're uh, away from home, but in closed indoor areas with people that they're not usually spending time with. So people wearing masks in those settings help slow down that transmission as well. Equally, people really at risk of infection and serious illness if they are infected, they're uh, more likely to keep wearing masks and that will help both them individually, but also that um, pressure, downward pressure on transmission in the community. So there will be targeted approaches. We have to put a lot of work into building a surveillance system that allows us to monitor what's happening in the community to keep our fingers on that pulse so that we know where the health departments do need to come in and be a bit more active. You're right, we're not going to see, you know, statewide lockdowns. We're not going to see border closures. Those things would only happen if we had a new, very worrying variant that popped up somewhere that we might want to try and contain to a part of the country. But in reality, these new variants don't get locked down very well. We saw that in uh, the Netherlands. They tried locking down during the Omicron outbreak and it did nothing in the end. It dropped cases initially and then they just took off. So I think what we're going to see is more um, strategies about a longer term uh, approach to who we test, how we keep an eye on what's happening in the population, making sure we're not seeing a shift in variants that could put more people in hospital. And importantly, monitoring immunity seeing if we are going to go to fourth boosters, or second boosters, but fourth doses, for those people who have not responded as well to the initial vaccinations or who are uh, of an older age group where you might not sustain that same level of immunity. So it'll be a bit more nuanced, a bit more tailored to parts of the population, moving away from some of the blanket approaches in disease control, but also even in our vaccination program. When might COVID, Catherine, become endemic in the community where it becomes a relatively constant presence circulating in the general population? And what will be the process of that happening? 
Well, the virus has already started its bit of the process. You know, it's in amongst us and we can't stop it. So we're, we're at the point now where the virus is with us. We need to make the transition, though, so we are managing it in a sustainable way going forward. And we have reduced that risk of illness and serious illness in particular, that burden on the hospitals, but also the risk of death as much as we possibly can in this transition time. So it's really when we reach a point where we think we've got the best controls we can have in place, that's now in place in a sustainable way. We're still part of a global approach to watching what happens with the virus. We're contributing to global disease control because that matters for the variants of concern. But we then go into a position where we have a long-term plan, but we're also monitoring for potential future pandemics if we do get a new variant, just as we do with flu. So flu we manage um, as a seasonal um, variant or variants, we, we watch what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere, we build vaccines around that. We may also have an ongoing vaccine program with COVID, at least for part of the community. That could even be combined with flu, we don't know yet. Well, we know that COVID measures like lockdowns and mask wearing have also resulted in fewer cases of illnesses like flu or the common cold. But now that those rules have been loosened, we're being told to prepare for a spike in viruses like the flu this coming winter. Charlotte Hespie is a GP and the New South Wales Chair of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. And she joins us now. Hi there, Charlotte. So during the pandemic then, what's, what happened to the infection rates of other conditions like the flu? Uh, we've had a ridiculously quiet time. Um, it's been very nice um, that we've had virtually no flu whatsoever. And we've had for children uh, no respiratory syncytial virus or rhinovirus either. So that's what's going to happen this time, this year, um, big time, is our fear. So as we return to some sort of normal, how vulnerable are we then to some of those conditions, given we've had less exposure to them for a couple of years? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's one of the big worries. So people are sort of less, a bit more nonchalant about it because we've sort of um, not been worrying about that. We've been worrying about COVID. We have two years of our children's population not having been exposed to uh, these viruses at all in their whole lives. So um, that's a sort of a cohort of babies right up to sort of the ages of three. And we have children attending school who might not have had that sort of preschool um, exposure to lots of viruses that happens in, you know, the, the wonderful daycare, snotty nose, cough, cough etc. Um, kids haven't had that um, very much over the last two years. There's been a bit, but very little. I understand there's likely to be an expected increase in gastro cases as well, Charlotte. Why gastro? Well, because gastro um, similarly is a viral infection that um, with the whole social distancing, masks, washing hands in particular and using hand disinfectant has responded very well to those measures. So we haven't seen very much of it. And now that people are going back to um, our previous sort of cultural behaviours in um, public places, those um, viruses are coming back again. OK, so which conditions are you most concerned about then? And are you... You're already seeing rising cases of those, some of those conditions, are you? Yeah, look, I mean, from my perspective, it's the sort of the whole works. For little children, um, you know, it's been very nice not having to have um, accident emergencies full of little kids with bronchiolitis and um, asthma type illnesses triggered by viruses. So we, we are at risk of seeing that again. So I think we need to be a lot more mindful about what the warning signs are, what the red flags are, because there's also going to be a set of parents that haven't had to um, experience wheezy children and being alert for them getting sick, noting that COVID pretty much has not affected little children very much. It, it has a bit, but, but, but very little. So um, I think there's sort of got to be an education program around what this looks like and also to sort of actually saying let's stay at home when we've got viral infections um, we've actually had a good two years let's learn something from that and rather than soldiering on um, let's get rid of that term altogether and say if you're sick stay at home share your virus with yourself not with your work colleagues and certainly you know try and keep your kids from sharing it with their friends Charlotte Hesby, thank you so much.
That is the show for this week. Thank you for your company. Bye for now.